Good morning, people here in the audience. Uh, good morning, people following us on live stream. So we are trying to stick to the uh, the uh, time schedule of the conference because people will be watching us online on different platforms and in three languages: English, Ukrainian, and Lithuanian. First of all, I would like to thank the Vitaut is the great war museum for hosting us here in this uh, extraordinary conference hall, museum, which temporarily is a conference hall. For those who are interested during the break, around the corner is a exhibition um, organized by our center, um, Kaleidoscope of Opposition to Communist Rule, with um, a lot of exponents artifacts, printing equipment with which uh, independent press was made. So to start with, I would like to invite the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania, Mantos Adaminis, to open the conference. Thank you. Distinguished colleagues, Professor Anne Warren, distinguished rector, dear colleagues. Well, congratulations, first of all, to all those present, present at the 12th Sakharov Conference, which is symbolically entitled Forgiving or Forgetting, Dealing with a Painful Past. The name of Andrei Sakharov in the current context is a particular symbol of the uncompromising struggle for world peace, for the victory of democracy, and human rights against totalitarianism and the ideology of violence. There is a great shortage of powerful voices such as Andrei Sakharov's in today's world, and especially in his native Russia. Sakharov and a handful of people called dissidents were not afraid to stand in front of them of the then seemingly unshakable Soviet government machine and boldly proclaim the long hidden truth to the people of this empire of lies. I quote, I have concluded that the most powerful weapon in the world is not a bomb, but the truth, unquote, Andrei Sakharov said at the time. Unfortunately, Russia, the self-proclaimed successor to the USSR, is currently living in, in a time of bombing, not truth-telling. This conference, albeit focused on discussing a painful past, responds very symbolically to the painful realities of today, to the tens of thousands of victims of the war in Ukraine and the changing security situation in Europe and around the world. The Ukrainian drama seems to have brought back to the world the memories of the greatest tragedies of the 20th century, civil and world wars, massacres, genocide, and other major crimes against people and humanity. Today's war, once again, trauma traumatized the Ukrainian nation, which had not managed to heal the traumas of the last century, best symbolized by the tragic Holodomor and the catastrophe of Chernobyl. It will take a long-term focused effort to cure these ever-deepening new wounds that will leave traces for decades to come. Such traumas are the greatest tragedy of humanity of this time. That is the greatest tragedy, and not the dismantling of the bloody empire of the Soviet Union, as Vladimir Putin would have it, thus using this formula to justify his crimes against the neighboring countries. This conference is taking place on a significant day for Lithuania, exactly 50 years after the tragic death of Rama Skalanta. The sacrifice of Rama Skalanta symbolically continued the struggle of the Lithuanian partisans for the restoration of the independence of Lithuania. It inspired the new, new generations to work for freedom and well-being of their homeland. Two decades later, this silent resistance spilled over into the singing revolution, the formation of national movement, Sayudis, and the restoration of independence, which we have been enjoying for more than three decades. 
So today, we commemorate the sacrifice of Roma Scalanta and other gener generous sacrifices placed on the altar of our independence. This conference will also bring back the memories of Irena Veisaite, the luminary of our country and the entire region. Her life and activities are the best symbol of spiritual resistance, proving that it is possible to overcome the darkest past, the Holocaust, and the traumas of the Soviet era, and to discover in that past what enriches us today and points the way to a brighter future. Irena Veisaite, like Andrei Sakharov, Witness the truth honestly and without compromise, setting an example for all of us. Such truth must be supported by all our activities for the good of our country and of all mankind. Recalling Roma Scalanta and Irena Veisaita today, we can say that after the restoration of independence of Lithuania and other Central European countries three decades ago, we have not yet freed ourselves from the clutches of the evil empire. And it still takes time, effort, and sacrifice. The traumas of the 20th century, and older still, affect relations between nations and states, preventing the establishment of good neighborly relations. The untreated or incompletely healed wounds of the past are passed down from generation to generation, and it is very difficult to break free from the vicious cycle. Only an open dialogue about these wounds and a concerted effort by professionals in various fields to heal them can help us to overcome this curse and help us break free from the grip of the past. I think this will be one of the cornerstones of this conference. I am glad that professionals from a wide range of fields, psychiatrists, historians, politicians, diplomats, journalists, artists, and others gather at this conference. Such an interdisciplinary dialogue allows us to look at the problems of past and present injuries from a wide variety of angles, thus increasing the chances of healing the traumas. Let us be aware that however unique is our experience in trauma treatment, it is applicable in other regions and continents. Nations and states must find the wisdom and strength to open the darkest pages of past relations and lay the foundations for mutual reconciliations and, and good neighbor, neighborliness. One of the best examples of the recent past is the relations between Lithuania and Poland, which in the course of several years, from an open confrontation became strategic partnership. Intellectuals from both countries, such as Jerzy Giedroitz, Czeslaw Milos, and Thomas Wenslova, have played a key role in this process. There are more examples of such good neighborliness and it's essential to examine them and disseminate good practice in other countries. Now, I wouldn't be from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs if I didn't say that the establishment of the EU and NATO and the enlargement processes of these organizations played an essential role in the reconciliation of nations in Europe and across the Atlantic. The prospect of membership of these organizations must continue to strengthen the good neighborly integration of the Eastern European and Western Balkan countries. It is necessary to send clear signals to these countries that the EU and NATO are open to enlargement and to formulate clear homeworks for accession. This political perspective of future membership is especially le relevant for Ukraine, which is fighting a war today. In today's world, we see how countries that do not guarantee human rights and democracy cannot overcome the wounds of the past and at the same time give birth to new traumas passed down from generation to generation. Only by developing democracy, consolidating human rights and freedom of expression, do we create the basis for an open dialogue on difficult issues of the past and present and for the treatment of wounds. Lithuania is a clear example of this. Only after regaining independence based on democracy and human rights were we able to speak aloud about the wounds of the past such as the Holocaust and the crimes committed by the Soviet regime. We are able to boldly name the victims and executioners, take steps to commemorate the victims and restore historical justice. Of course, not everything has been accomplished in this area. There are still isolated cases of xenophobia and anti-Semitism, but we are already able to respond to them in timely and appropriate manner and move forward. 
Important topics in this context are controversial historical personalities and controversial monuments in public spaces. Such examples can be found in the history of Lithuania during the two occupations. We need to find in ourselves the wisdom and courage to name objective facts, though perhaps not very pleasing to us, so that these topics do not further divide society and encourage discord among people. Unfortunately, there are examples in our region where countries fail to come to terms with their history and avoid telling the truth by all means. Today's Russia is the country that uses the distortion of history to justify its current aggressive policy. The tendentious use of terms such as Nazism, nationalism, and Banderovsky provide an imaginary basis for war with neighboring Ukraine. And in fact, such labeling only shows that Russia itself has not yet dealt with its history and is looking for an excuse for the aggressive intentions of the, presence, of the present. In this way, Russia itself becomes a hostage to its cruel history, unable to follow the path of normal development based on democratic uh, democracy and rule of law. According to Nobel Prize winner Svetlana Alexievich, I quote, Russia has a difficult relationship not only with the future, but also with the past, unquote. And countries that are unable to look objectively at their past and assess the mistakes of the past will not be able to lay the foundations for a future based on human rights and dignity. Therefore, we must consistently rely on all the beginnings of democracy and human rights in Russia. We should support people who think independently. The annual meetings of representatives of Russian civil society in Lithuania and, of course, such a conference as today's contribute to this. Unfortunately, the process of civil and political maturity in Russia is increasingly hampered by restrictions on free speech, harassment, and the closure of the media and non-governmental organizations. Putin's current regime can be justly compared to the Nazism, Stalinism, and other manifestations of totalitarianism of the last century. It will leave the same deep wounds that will need to be healed for decades. Russian war crimes in Ukraine must be investigated and the perpetrators indicted at The Hague. At the same time, the memory of the victims must be duly respected, as has been done with the victims of the atrocities of the 20th century. We also need to talk about compensation for the relatives of those victims. Russia has a long way to go in its relations with other countries, especially its neighbors and countries in the region, in order to achieve full, equal, and partnership-based relations free from threats, dictatorship, or other manifestations of force. However, now Russia is moving in the opposite direction, trying to justify its aggressive policies with narratives of lies and propaganda. As Andrei Sakharov put it, I quote, a country which does not respect the rights of its own citizens will not respect the rights of its neighbors, unquote. The themes of today's conference successfully combine the past with the present, interpreting history for today, encouraging learning from the most painful mistakes of the past. Only by analyzing these lessons will we find a way to overcome the pains of today and lay the foundations for a brighter tomorrow. At today's conference, you will look at the traumas of the past, apartheid in South Africa and genocide in Srebrenica, the wounds of the present in Ukraine and Russia. The conference will talk about the clarification of the victims of collective trauma and the commemoration of their memory, the restoration of historical justice. Based on good examples, it will discuss the possibilities of healing wounds between nations and states and building trust and good neighborliness. In closing, I thank you for inviting me to this conference and I wish the participants a good and meaningful discussion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Adaminas, the Excellency. I would like to invite Mindaugas Norkiewicz, Vice Dean of the Faculty of uh, Political Science and uh, Diplomacy, uh, to speak on behalf of the University. Of 12 Andriy Sakharov Conference. Welcome to Kaunas, welcome to Vitotas Magnus University. I am glad to open such an important conference, gun blazing just around the corner, force 
us all to concentrate, stay alert, and focus on what we do best. It is, of course, the duty of academia to analyze and debate in order to find answers to difficult questions. Today, we are gathered to discuss the topic of memory, which is important for the region. As is well already mentioned, the conference forgiving or forgetting dealing with the painful past concludes the celebration of the essential of the scientist, humanist, and Nobel Peace Prize laureate Andrei Sakharov. The theme of the conference was before the outbreak of the war in Ukraine. It was intended to bring together scholars, psychologists, trauma experts, and politicians to reflect on the traumatic historical events and experience of the past. The plan to discuss how countries can recover from the dark phases of history to answer is uncomfortable questions. What history has left us in the way labyrinth of multifaceted social memory. However, the war in Ukraine forced the organizers to adjust the program. A year ago, despite the erosion of freedoms in Belarus and the growing human rights violations in Russia, there was no signs of the war. The intentions to hope for a mutual understanding seems still possible and justified and Sakharov authority and his lessons he detected were not a bad way to learn from the past and avoid the mistakes of distracted for human rights. Everything fell apart overnight. Today, it is clear that such a strategy is no longer possible without resolving the continent of Russia. On the other hand, after all, were it not the discussion who repeatedly uh, born of Russia dangerous development ambitions, despite the borrowing gap between the declarative concern for human rights and the actual relegation to the margins of a political agenda, where voices have remained unheard. Andrei Sakharov was a leader who inspired generations of people to fight for freedom and human rights by his example. Sakharov's legacy is still relevant in today's climate. It reminded that human rights and the principle of democracy are always fighting for. There are always treats and challenges to overcome. For Sakharov, Human rights were not a simple slogan, but first and foremost, an integral part of moral choices. In the today events, it is unfortunate to say that this round has been lost quite painfully. The questions for all of us, what will we learn? To paraphrase Sakharov, we have a to fight the illusion that progress is possible, technology without empathy. Progress is impossible without freedom and genuine respect for each other. Having this in mind, the importance of this conference is bigger and your task to find clear answers to difficult like how to balance memory and foster cohesion instead of revenge, how to cultivate solidarity and empathy instead of fragmentation into narrow interest. Once again, by leaving you with this difficult question, I congratulate all participants, presenters, guests with this important endeavor and wish you all productive discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Nakavichus. So, ladies and gentlemen, 
This conference was planned before the war. I'm saying this exactly with these words because I belong to a Western European generation that still talked about before the war and after the war, meaning the Second World War. I was born 14 years after the Second World War ended, but bar war was a daily subject in my life from the very early age onwards. As a psychiatrist friend of the same age once told me, we are war children. For us, war is a daily point of reference. The current generations are peace children. In this part of the world, peace children are still relatively rare. Yes, here in Lithuania, we have had 30 years of freedom and relative peace, even with a constant threat coming from Russia. But in the Caucasus, the concept of peace children never managed to develop. And the same counts for many of the other former Soviet republics. In Chechnya, the Russian scorched earth policy led to a totally devastated nation with a moral degenerate like Ramzan Kandyrov as a result. And now in Ukraine, and possibly also in other European countries, including Lithuania, we will again have a generation of war children, of people who think only in two terms, before the war and after the war. That, ladies and gentlemen, is an unbearable thought, yet it is a reality. When we planned this conference, we wanted to discuss pathways to overcome the horrors of the past and also the increasingly disturbing ways in which Russian leaders were rewriting the past and creating a new Stalinist or Putinist reality and how they were becoming increasingly aggressive towards the internal enemy, the so-called fifth column, and an imagined external one. The conference was supposed to be mostly reflective, maybe even philosophical, but now suddenly this all changed. On a daily basis, we watch the horrors of the Russian hordes plundering, raping, torturing and killing innocent citizens in Ukraine, bombing away whole cities, and then cynically declaring victory after a so-called successful operation. The so-called denazification campaign is implemented with a playbook that would fit perfectly in the, to the Nazis in, during the Second World War and is no less violent than the behavior of the Reds during the Civil War in Russia more than a century ago. Three years ago, we organized a conference here in Kaunas on building bridges, thoughts about the other Russia, trying to counter the narrative that Putin and Russia were identical. We had half a dozen speakers on stage, including Mikhail Shishkin, who joined us again today. And I remember that during the discussion, one of my friends from Russia got up and said, it's so nice what you're saying here, but you forget. Russia has become a country of rednecks, Bitla. We all felt that he was too extreme, but today we see this Bitla ravaging Ukraine and stealing everything it can find, like a plague of locusts. For me, who grew up in an environment with constant recollections of the horrors of the Nazi period, it is sometimes as if I'm pulled back into the 1930s and early 1940s. And I can imagine how people felt then, how they were overwhelmed by the sudden bombardment with violence, death, hatred, and fear. And I realized that these feelings are now felt by our Ukrainian friends, by the Ukrainian people, and that life will never be the same again. We see the new Lidiches and Oradurs, European towns that were razed to the ground by the Nazis during punitive actions out of pure vengeance. And we see how identical Putinism and Nazism actually are. It's happening again, exactly the same. We have Bucha, we have Irpin, Baradyanka, and not to forget Mariupol, 
towns that will have the same place in history, symbols of carnage and the indescribable horrors of war. And we see every day that the real Nazis are sitting in the Kremlin, continuing the peculiar Soviet ability to use vocabulary with a totally opposite meaning, like liberating, meaning in fact extermination, and human rights, meaning torture and killing. Considering this, to me, the attitude of many of the Germans is hard to understand. It seems that their sense of guilt for what they did over 85 years ago has paralyzed them and created a totally wrong narrative. Their fear to upset the Russians because of the Nazi crimes has blurred their understanding even of the past because they have accepted the false narrative of the Russians that it was they who suffered most during the Nazi period. Yet when one looks at the facts, it were in fact the Belarusians and the Ukrainians who suffered most, much more than the Russians. And this feeling of guilt has resulted in a kind of mystic understanding of the so-called Russian soul, which has nothing to do with reality, but there's a sort of blanket that covers their inability to accept that Russia is now the same as Nazi Germany, and that with their policy of appeasement, they have helped create this monster. Only now, after two and a half months of destructive warfare before our eyes, and after tens of thousands of innocent deaths, they are starting to shift, albeit still very hesitantly. So we find ourselves in a strange situation in which we will be talking about the past, while at the same time a different future is created before our eyes. The world will not be the same. And unless we all understand that, it is, that this is the moment of win or lose, we might wind up in a situation that such conferences will no longer be possible because we will all have fallen victim to the madness now coming from Russia. Still, I think it is important that we discuss elements of the past, even today, because I believe the future is on our side, and there will be a day that we can build again a better future, a free and democratic future, not only in Ukraine, but also in other countries that are now part of Putin's playground, such as neighboring Belarus. In fact, I believe that what we see today is the continuation of the process that started 35 years ago, when Lithuania took the road to independence, did the impossible, and by declaring reinstating independence, it triggered the partial disintegration of the Soviet Union. Partial because the process stopped in 1991 and was actually never completed. The Russian Federation survived as a sort of small Soviet Union, went through a decade of relative freedom, and then gradually came back under the leadership of Yuri Andropov's faithful here, Vladimir Putin. And what now needs to happen is the completion of the process, the final deathbed of the USSR. In conclusion, I want to come back to that heroic role that Lithuania played. Indeed, Lithuania was at the forefront of the liberation struggle, but to my surprise, and sometimes even dismay, I see that the country does not rightfully honor those who fought for the freedom during the post-war Soviet period, but tends to focus still more on glorifying the leading role in European history in the 15th, 16th, and 17th century. I understand that talking about the distant past is safer than the more recent one, but the result is that young people do not even remember their recent heroes or how their freedom came about. Why does Solidarność in Poland have a huge and multifaceted educational center in Gdańsk? And why in Katowice there is a new and beautiful museum at the Wujek mine, where in December 1981, nine miners were killed by Jaruzelski's troops? Why is there a Jan Palach museum? And is the name of Jan Palach known throughout Europe? 
and is Romas Kalanta still hardly known? Even in Lithuanian, knowledge is rather superficial. Why was there no interest when we developed a dissident tour of Vilnius, trying to mark the places in the city that were so important to the recognition of the fight against Soviet occupational power? I have my thoughts why this happened, but I would need much more time than I have today to explain why I think this happened. What is important here is that, in my view, this ought to be addressed. The heroes of the recent past need to have their place in history, in the public domain, because how can we otherwise mobilize young people to defend the freedom that they have now, the freedom that Putin and his criminal regime despises and wants to destroy? This, ladies and gentlemen, is, in my view, one of the most important tasks ahead. In the city, you will see many posters of our I am no Sakharov but campaign. This campaign was developed before the war and then slightly adjusted to the new realities. And it is important, I think, especially at this moment, because I can assure you that Sakharov would have stood up immediately and, saw, and said what he thought about this criminal war and would have accepted the consequences, whatever they might be. His example is more important today than it ever was, but Tatjana Jankilevich will tell you more about this. Thank you. So I would like to give the floor to Tatjana Jankilevich. She's an independent researcher affiliated with the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard University. She is a retired educator in the field of post-World War II Soviet history and the Soviet human rights movement. She emigrated to the US, USA in 1977. And during the 1970s and 1980s, she campaigned extensively on behalf of her stepfather, Andrei Dmitry Sakharov, and for his causes in the US and in Europe. And she helped maintain his archives, translated a lot of his correspondence statements and other materials, and then did the editorial work for the publication in English and Russian of his writings. From 2004 to 2009, she was director of the Sakharov Program on Human Rights at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard University, which is now the home of the Andrei Sakharov Archive. Tatiana, the floor is yours. Hello, hello everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you for being here. And thank you very much, Robert, for your uh, kind words about me. And I was very much impressed that um, the previous speakers have um, quoted the um, um, Sakharov's words that I was planning to quote, so forgive the repetition, but it, it uh, confirms that we are all on the same wavelength, on the same page, and I hope that we will stay that way. And as already was mentioned uh, by Mr. Adamanas and by uh, Robert Van Warren, uh, when the, the plans for this uh, conference, this 12th Sakharov conference were being discussed and my participation was being planned, we could not have imagined uh, circumstances under which we meet today. For nor the two years of the unprecedented pandemic, nor the increasingly populist with fascist overtones political developments in the United States and both Western and Eastern Europe, nor the growing anxiety over the fate of the civic society and democratic forces in Russia, not even the cruel destruction of the International Memorial Society and Human Rights Center. None of these could have prepared us for what we are all living through uh, for almost three months today. Since February 24th, we find ourselves in a different time and universe, and my focus has been necessarily shifted by these tragic, bloody, and cruel events. 
Russia's unprovoked violence against Ukraine, multiplied by the deluge of malicious disinformation meant to justify the Russian invasion, by lies and cynicism, outrages me to the core of my being. The everyday news of the human price, the pain, the suffering, the blood and carnage gives me a lump in my throat and chokes my speech. And yet this is exactly when we must speak up, must stand up to oppose evil that today has taken a human form. But what is there to say in the face of such overwhelming evil? Can we hope to say something meaningful? Can we even begin to, hope, to keep the hope alive? I confess that I am on the verge of despairing, if not beyond it. Wouldn't it be naive and self-deceitful to grasp at uh, straws of humanism, belief in reason, and in high-minded ideas? Perhaps, but at least we would not fall into outright cynicism. And in a way, this would help us do our duty as human beings. Let's remember Sakharov, who was fond of saying, do what you must, come what may. 33 years after Sakharov's passing, I find it bitterly sad and tragic that most of issues crucial for the survival of humanity and of his own country, issues that Sakharov addressed throughout his work, are manifestly present in the today's Russia, the country of his birth and of his final resting place. Perhaps in this Andrei Sakharov centenary year, we can find a source of hope in his legacy, central to which was the concept of moral principles and intellectual responsibility. Uh, in 1981, in bitter Gorky exile, Sakharov finished working on an essay entitled The Responsibility of the Scientist. In it, he assigned a special place for courage integrity and honesty as essential to the fulfillment of one's responsibility as they make it possible to um, resist the temptations or, and habits of conformity. In this essay, he named 55 prisoners of conscience in his own country, the USSR. One of them was a biologist, Sergei Kovalev, whose trial in 1975 took place in Lithuania, in Vilnius, on the same day, uh, on the same days, the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony for Sakharov was taking place in Oslo. And the trial of Kovalev, Sakharov was prevented from attending by the KGB. Years later, Kovalev, by then a free man, summarized Sakharov's moral makeup as follows. Andrei Dmitrievich was the bearer of thinking based on reason. His intellectual work, whether it concerned science, politics, or the struggle for human rights, was fully in line with the qualities that define a true scientist. These qualities can be reduced to three freedoms. He was free of fear, selfishness, and free of prejudice. Is it new morality? No, it's the most ordinary human morality, only very consistent. The last time it was formulated with the utmost clarity was about 2,000 years ago in the ancient legends of mankind where the fruits that allow to distinguish good from evil grow on the tree of knowledge. Ordinary human morality, unlike that of the saints and of the prophets, is based on reason and on nothing else. And Sakharov's consistency in the implementation of moral principles is simply another name for intellectual responsibility." End of quote. Today we regard Andrei Sakharov as one of the 20th century historic figures of Russia and of the world. This is guaranteed by his scientific achievements, 
including his role in the development of the Soviet nuclear weapons, and by his courage and humanism as a dissident and public figure. Sakharov's faith in reason was originally limited to the sphere of nuclear weapons, stirred by the ethical implications of testing these weapons in the atmosphere. Uh, it acquired a moral sensibility, and this led to a far more profound concern with the, universe sphere, with the universal sphere of human rights. Sakharov bonded reason with ethics and applied ideas not only to an astonishing range of scientific subjects, but also ultimately to matters of human freedom and world peace. He was among a small group of Soviet dissidents that chose to take a stand for human rights at great risk to their freedom and life. They made an historic uh, difference, none more so than Andrei Sakharov. He had the vision of the world with ideological differences set aside, creating common ground around universal principles of human rights and accountability to citizens in order to repair the problems of, the hour, of our world. Today, at the time of unprecedented and violent developments in the post-totalitarian Eastern Europe and in the world in general, this vision is as vital as it was in his lifetime. Sakharov's centennial is an opportunity to seek not only peace, but authentic and selfless collaboration in solving the problems of the world, such as poverty, environmental challenges, oppression, and most of all, war, military crimes, and crimes against humanity. Andrei Sakharov came to embody values shared by most people of our planet, including Russia, courage, open debate, scholarship, transparency, peace, and freedom. For many years, civil society organizations in Russia has been uh, courageously working to realize Sakharov's vision of peace and human rights until the most recent cruel suppression of all democratic NGOs, including the M Memorial Society. I would like to offer a few words what seems to be to me, uh, definitive in Sakharov's uh, social political position. In an essay um, on Sakharov evolution as social philosopher and the humanist Ifrem Yankilevich wrote, I quote, Sakharov possessed a rare talent, empathy with human suffering, no matter where it occurred. The planetary nature of Sakharov's thought, his worldview, issued from conviction about the connectedness of the fates of humankind, which he shared with forerunners, Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr. We are all in one boat and we will perish together or be saved together. And finally, Sakharov believed that social and technical progress can and should relieve human suffering. More precisely, Sakharov's democratic convictions brought him to believe that people are capable of rationally constructing their public life and rationally employing the fruits of scientific progress. End of quote. First formulated in his Nobel Peace Prize lecture of 1975, Andrei Sakharov promoted the principle of indivisibility of human rights and international security, now universally recognized as the Sakharov Doctrine. He lived to witness the end of Cold War, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the beginning of what seemed like the New World Order, where human rights would be respected. However, the hopes were soon dashed as much of the post-Soviet world reverted to authoritarian rule, the suppression of fundamental human rights, and to the criminalization of dissent. This negative dynamic has ultimately undermined international stability and security, culminating in the unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Today's Ru Russia's uh, power structures have all but succeeded to take the country back to totalitarianism. The memory of henchmen 
be it Dzerzhinsky, Beria, or Stalin, responsible for crimes against humanity and mass murder of tens of millions of the innocents has been immortalized and perpetuated. The FSB, Federal, uh, Service of, um, uh, Federal Bureau of uh, Security, proudly declares itself as a direct heir to the KGB while practicing the extrajudicial murders of Kremlin opponents with internationally prohibited chemical weapons. It's worth pausing for a moment to think just how extra extraordinary that is. A European government in the 21st century is operating a professional squad of assassins uh, tasked with killing its opponents. Human rights in the post-Soviet space deserve the attention uh, of the international community and constructive measures to protect these rights by the country's signatories of the Helsinki Accords, even and, even and perhaps especially in the times of Russia's violent aggression. Across much of the post-Soviet space, the curtailment of fundamental freedoms and the rapid shrinking of space for civic society are a serious cause for concern. Civil society, civil society has been unlawfully stifled and strangled. The most recent and reprehensible was the state-sponsored destruction of the Memorial Society, re renowned world over for its courageous work to preserve historic memory of victims of the past atrocities and to defend the unjustly persecuted of today. In my opinion, there is an affinity between the worldview of uh, Vladimir Vernadsky and Andrei Sakharov when it comes to the idea of humankind's planetary unity and to the need for a new global morality. Uh, the, these two great men uh, share the belief in the power of reason and free thought, the sense that history is a sum of human endeavors. From this worldview is born the sense of duty to mankind, not to any one ideology, a sense of responsibility for the course of human events. In the midst of great terror, Vernadsky contemplated the place of free thought and moral responsibility of a scientist as a free individual in civic sphere. He considered it essential, and I quote, speaking the truth with no concessions. This was particularly difficult under the Soviet regime with its total ideologization of science and destruction of science's independence. Today, the international civic community faces new challenges and is yet to live up to its responsibility to humanity. A new challenge is presented uh, by the need for coronavirus cure. Another responsibility is to continue preventing our planet's self-annihilation in a nuclear confrontation. And much like in the times of Sakharov, there still remains a duty to defend unjustly persecuted wherever these in injustices may be taking place. Today, this duty is particularly poignant and urgent. Even before the despicable aggression against Ukraine, Russian irresponsible leadership took Russia in a direction that goes against everything Sakharov believed in. And I'm referring to the amendments to, the, uh, to Russia's constitution that allow the president to remain in power almost indefinitely. Amendments that effectively end the separation of the state and the church, insult and alienate non-Russian citizens of Russian Federation and make any criticism of the powers that be a criminal offense. I'd like to remind you that this is exactly the scenario Sakharov warned against shortly before he died when campaigning against the unlimited powers granted any country leader, however humane. What the global community can learn from Andrei Sakharov's life. Sakharov was one of the very few to, to, uh, who had intellectual courage and idealism 
to speak his mind. Many conformists and opportunists saw him as God's fool. Some even proclaimed him insane. It turned out that he saw farther than most. His destiny was unique, but that does not make it less possible for us to walk in his footsteps. Today's developments in Eastern Europe make speaking truth to power particularly urgent. We must summon our intellectual and civic courage to stand up to the Belarusian government cruel repression of civil society organizations and to unlawful and arbitrary persecution of the Russian um, of the Russian of the Russian civic NGOs and above all to Russia's cynical, irresponsible, and criminal assault on a neighboring country, Ukraine, three months ago, almost three months ago. In my mind, there is no doubt that this horrendous decision is the result of the unquenchable lust for power of Vladimir Putin, the world, the, the, the would-be absolute monarch type dictator whose deranged view of history and Russian imperial nostalgia took him down the perilous path of war. We can seek inspiration for our actions in the Sakharov Doctrine central concept, the indivisibility of peace, international security, and human rights. It began to take shape in the early 1970s out of concern that political detente of Brezhnev and Nixon without democratization of the closed Soviet society and I quote, would be very dangerous and it would not really solve any of the world's uh, problems. It would mean capitulating to the growing power of the USSR. This would be an attempt to trade with the Soviet Union getting gas and oil, but ignoring all the other issues involved. It would mean the cultivation and encouragement of a closed country, end of quote. And in, in his uh, uh, Nobel lecture of 1975, Sakharov states, I quote, I am convinced that international trust, mutual understanding, disarmament, and international security are inconceivable without an open society, freedom of information, freedom of conscience, glassness, freedom of movement, and freedom to choose one's country of residence." End of quote. Sakharov doctrine rests on three arguments. First, if a state is a threat to its own citizens, it will be a threat to its neighbors. That's exactly what Minister Adamanis uh, was quoting. Second, respect for human rights ensures democratic oversight of a country's foreign policy and military expenditures, and society will not permit militarization of the economy during peacetime. Third, observance of human rights would safeguard the free exchange of information and ideas, foster rapprochement, and lower mutual distrust, reducing the likelihood of conflict and the possibility of secretly nurturing aggressive intentions. A broad interpretation of Sakharov's works permits introduction of a fourth argument. Human rights should, be, should become a universal value, and this commonality of values will reduce the possibility of conflicts, of ideologies, or of civilizations. In other words, Sakharov supposes that common values can guarantee lasting peace, and such values can be based on generally accepted human rights. Peace founded on such values is all the more possible because the ideology of human rights, in Sakharov opinion, is universal. And I quote, the ideology of human rights is probably the only one which can be combined with such diverse ideologies as communism, social democracy, religion, technocracy, and nationalism. The defense of human rights is a clear path towards the unification of peoples in our turbulent world and to the relief of their suffering." End of quote. 
it follows logically that if a tyrannical government doesn't wish to respect the rights of its citizens, the international community must try to compel this country to respect them. Thus, human rights cease to be a state internal affair and their defense because, becomes a subject of international concern. As early as in 1968, in his reflections, Sakharov wrote, international control presupposes the use of economic sanctions as well as the use of armed forces of the United Nations in defense of human rights. The goal of international policy is to ensure worldwide fulfillment of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and to prevent a sharpening of international tensions or a strengthening of militarism or nationalism." End of quote. I hold most dearly a hope that this and the future, hopefully, Sakharov conferences and eventually the renewed Sakharov hearings will help defend those persecuted today. As Sakharov put it, concerted actions in defense of the repressed will help ease their fate and strengthen the international community, its authority and effectiveness. Today, perhaps for the first time since World War II, all of us are facing a highly sensitive issue of moral responsibility, whether personal or collective, once again. We witness that many representatives of Russian cultural and scientific elite support Putin's crackdown on fundamental human rights. Besides being morally deplorable, this support made possible the crimes against humanity perpetrated by the Russian troops, for which the leadership of, Russian, of Russia bears direct responsibility. Still, let's not forget that many of Russia's and former Soviet Union scholars and scientists and uh, people of um, creative professions and public figures have spoken out in protest, the cruel, protesting the cruel crackdown of the freedom of exchange for, of ideas, of self-expression, of peaceful pro protests, and most re recently, the criminal war in Ukraine. They are increasingly persecuted, often under false pretexts, denied fair trial, or due course of justice. There is no doubt in my mind that they deserve our support and that we have a moral obligation to speak out in their defense. By doing so, we would be following the path taken by Sakharov, Kovalev, and many others who chose to defend those persecuted. As Sakharov put it, taking the path of active and selfless struggle for human rights we change something for the better in the moral image of our world. On a less romantic note, he believed that a moral choice proves to be a pragmatic one in the long run. I also want to invoke Sakharov's staunch opposition and condemnation of the war in Afghanistan. In the short period between the Soviet invasion on December 24th, 1979, and his own unlawful and arbitrary uh, internal exile to the city of Gorky on January 22nd, 1980, less than a month from the invasion, Sakharov issued important statements and appeals on the criminal irresponsibility and inadmissibility of such actions. And here's, I quote from his interview, uh, the most important thing that should concern everyone in the world is the war raging in Afghanistan and the threat of its escalation and expansion. Every day, every hour, the Afghani people are dying, Soviet soldiers are dying, and their families receive notifications of death." End of quote. Today, 77 years after Nazi Germany unconditional surrender, much like Nazi regime in 1939 and 1941, treacherously without declaring war, 
Russian President Putin sent troops into a sovereign state. Russia's military bombs cities, kills civilians, including children, deprives overnight six million people of homes and normal life. Putin's regime brazenly lies to its own people, robbed of the freedom of speech and the right to truthful information. Today's atrocities by Russian troops in Ukraine trample the memory of those who died so that the horrors of that war would never be repeated. We can repeat Russia's marching slogan of today is a travesty of those fallen in World War II and of their ultimate sacrifice. Putin's assertions about Nazis in Kyiv are baseless but there are striking analogies between the way the Soviet Red Army operated during World War II and the way the Russian army is operating currently against Ukraine. Gratuitous brutality towards civilians, rape as a tool of warfare, soldiers as cannon fodder, mass looting. These analogies, far from reflecting favorably on either the Red Army or today's Russian Army, underscore the deeply immoral nature of Russia's war in Ukraine. Is there any doubt what Sakharov would be doing today, were he alive? Not unlike the early 1980s, he would put out a plan, a roadmap of actions essential to restoring peace. In his statements just before his exile, followed by his undeterred stand already after deportation to Gorky, he called the sending of Soviet troops into Afghanistan a terrible mistake that caused thousands of Soviet casualties and endangered world peace. He spelled out his ideas on a settlement, including a ceasefire and Soviet withdrawal, with the United Nations forces taking the place of Soviet troops. He insisted that the UN Security Council plus Afghanistan's neighbors guarantee the country's independence and that, and that the United Nations member states grant asylum to uh, the refugees fleeing Afghanistan. He insisted that international economic aid should flow into the country and that Moscow should contribute to it. Sakharov also called for the amnesty for political prisoners within the USSR. He said, Soviet authorities are trying to degrade and discredit me in a way that unties the government's hand for any future repression of dissidents inside the country. He proclaimed this as his philosophy. I support a pluralistic, open society that is both democratic and just. I support convergence, disarmament, and peace, the defense of human rights throughout the world in our countries and the countries of Western Europe, Indonesia, Chile, China, everywhere, a world amnesty for prisoners of conscience and the abolition of the death sentence." End of quote. Today, these words are resonant again as Russia suppressed dissident, dissent and opposition uh, by maligning it, and then invading the independent Ukraine, destabilizing the entire region, ignoring all ethical norms, conventions, and laws, and violating its own international obligations. If that were not enough, it irresponsibly threatens the use of nuclear arms. That would be a particularly alarming aspect for Sakharov, whose sensibility to the nuclear saber rattling was incomparable. In all his public work, he stressed the inadmissibility and criminality of such threats and has done much for the disarmament and strategic parity. In his 1983 essay, Danger of Thermonuclear War, he warned against the insanity of mutual nuclear annihilation and called on humanity to step away from this peril as a sane man would step away from the edge of 
precipice. Let's give some thought to the transformation the world has undergone in the seven decades since the creation of nuclear arms. Uh, since the day they started to serve the purpose of nuclear containment and deterrent, to which Sakharov contribution is, cannot be overestimated. We now find ourselves in a world where a nuclear superpower threatens to unleash its nuclear arsenal against the non-threatening neighbors just to cater to its leaders' unquenchable lust for power. This is a new and horrifying phase of state terrorism, and even more so, it is nuclear terrorism. I cannot imagine Sakharov remaining complacent in today's situation, when the uh, utterly irresponsible use of deadly weapons of mass destruction threatens the very existence of entire humanity. Sakharov was convinced that disarmament, especially nuclear disarmament, is mankind's most important task. He made a special mention of the role of fundamental rights in the process of achieving the, this overarching goal. In his open letter to president of the Soviet Academy of Sciences, Sakharov said, I am convinced that the prevention of thermonuclear war must take absolute priority over all other issues. This resolution of the problem uh, involves politics, economics, the creation of international trust among open societies, the unconditional observance of fundamental civil and political rights and disarmament. Together with the energetic defense of all unjustly persecuted, a united, resolute, and steadfast effort to end the war in Ukraine would contribute to the uh, cause of keeping alive the legacy of Andrei Sakharov. I thank you very much. Before we uh, go for our coffee break, I would like to explain, if you go during the coffee break in that corner, you will find this exhibition that we have here for a month, which is called Kaleidoscope of Opposition to Communist Rule. We have a guidebook that you can take. But then also in the corner, we have, um, in short, the, this campaign that I mentioned during my opening speech, uh, I am no Sakharov, but... So you will find on the wall the five posters that are here in the city with the five influencers that participated in the campaign, including uh, Vitaltas Landsbergis, who was the uh, chairman of the same as when Lithuania reinstated the independence. But you will also find empty posters, which you can complete yourself. So there are filled pens there. You can write whatever you want and then make a photo of yourself, put it on social media. And there is a big one on the wall where people can also write their thoughts. And so we are collecting thoughts from the, uh, the audience. There are a few people who have been writing already. So I really would like to invite you to participate in the campaign. And we will be very gladly seeing your posters on your social media. So we will have a coffee break now and resume at 11.15 sharp. Thank you.
tonight we will be having a concert, a Presun Rev, in the Grand Hall of Vitautas Magnus University across the street from here. Starts at um, 7 o'clock. It's a, con a concert by the other side pianist uh, Alexei Potvinov and the Lithuanian choir Lietova. And it's a concert specially organized for Ukrainian refugees and volunteers who are helping the refugee community here in Lithuania to settle temporarily. And we are also collecting funds to be used for our psychological aid program to the uh, Ukrainian population, about which we will be talking at this conference a bit later. So I would like to uh, introduce the next speaker, Olesi Stashuk from Ukraine. She is Director General of the National Holodomor Museum. She got her higher education at the uh, Mihailo Kotsubinsky Pedagogical Uni University in Vinitsa, and then continued her studies at the Tarashevchenko University in uh, Kiev. Her PhD thesis was on deformation of the traditional culture of Ukrainians in the late 1920s, early 1930s. And uh, in December, she defended her doctoral dissertation at the Institute of Commissioner, on the Institute of Commissioners in the 1932 and 1933 Holodomor. So she is general director of the Holodomor Museum since March 2015. Olesia, very happy to have you here. Uh, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. For me, it's a great honor to take part in the 12th Sakharov International Conference. In October 1971, Andrei Sakharov spent two days in Kyiv. Uh, he came to Kyiv for the purpose of attending the trial of Anatoly Lupinis, who served several times in Soviet concentration camps and again there to commit a so-called anti-Soviet crime by reciting his own poem, I saw a mother dishonored about the tragic fate of Ukraine in the 20th century. It was at the monument of Ukraine's great bar, Taras Shevchenko, on the 22nd of March. At that time, the KGB called people like Lupinis Ukrainian bourgeois nationalists. And it should be noted that Anatoly Lupinis was first arrested by the communist regime in October 1956 for protesting the Soviet invasion of Hungary with a poster saying, Hands off free Hungary. In October 1971, Admiral Dmitrievich Sakharov was not allowed into Kiev's uh, courthouse where the reprisal against Lupinis was to take place. The Soviet regime did not want public hearings and consequently publicity of the lawsuits of Ukrainian dissidents. Andrei Dmitrievich was well aware of this and he defended all dissidents, regardless of their nationality. This fact is evidenced by the list of detainees and prisoners, which he periodically made public and passed on to the Western media. The names of Ukrainian dissidents were always a prominent part of these lists. It should be noted that Ukrainians in the political prisoner camps of the USSR were many, about 30%, despite the fact that the population of Ukraine was only about 20% of the total population of the USSR. Former camp inmate Semyon Manhlusman called it an enzyme of resistance. The struggle for liberation from totalitarian rule continued among Ukrainians even in the worst and darkest times of the communist regime. By the way, as a man Luzman works today at our Holodomor Studies Institute of the National Museum of the Holodomor Genocide. A few years ago, Robert Van Voren asked us Ukrainians, do you need Andrei Sakharov today? 
His homeland does not need him. He is dangerous. Yes, we need Sakharov. We need a memory of him. There is no doubt that if Andrei Dmitrievich were alive today, he would stand with Ukraine and the civilized world, not with Putin. On February 24th, 2022, the Russian Federation launched an unwarranted full-scale military invasion of our country. The gloomy symbolism of this event is that it's taking place in the year of the 19th anniversary of the Holodomor, the genocide of Ukrainians, the famine committed by the communist totalitarian regime in 32-33. Exactly 90 years later, in the 21st century, Russia is once again committing genocide against Ukrainians around the world. How could this be? Why today, like in Stalin's time, we hear orders from Kremlin's officers orders to kill Ukrainians to destroy the foundations of the independent existence of an entire nation? The answer to this question is obvious. Evil can come back only because it was not punished in its time. Unfortunately, there were but few people who carried the light of truth and struggle for human rights in the Soviet times. Under the communist totalitarian regime founded by Lenin and built up by Stalin, any opposition of the dominant narrative meant self-sacrifice and great risk. People who dared speak the word of truth thus chose a dangerous path of tough struggle. The commonest way to survive in totalitarian times was silence and servility. The silence of millions, however, led to millions of victims. Ukrainians are one of those nations that fully experienced during the 20th century all the methods of totalitarian oppression and mass extermination. For our people, this tragic road began in the autumn of 1917, at the moment when the communist Bolshevik regime was established in a part of the territory of the former Russian Empire. Initially, the Russian Bolsheviks failed to extend their power to the Ukrainian lands. When the Russian Empire collapsed, Ukrainians as well as Lithuanians, Latvians, Estonians, Poles and Finns could set themselves free from the Russian rule and began to create their own state. The Ukrainian People's Republic was proclaimed in Kiev, and in the following years, it received diplomatic recognition from several major states in Europe and Asia. However, in the outcome of the three Russian-Ukrainian wars of 1917-1920, the Russian Bolsheviks were able to occupy most of Ukraine's lands. Immediately after the establishment of its regime in Ukraine, there, by the Kremlin's order, a food army was created to seize grain and move it from Ukraine to Russia. In order to ultimately quash the guerrilla resistance and establish rat monopoly, the occupiers used an extremely insidious weapon of mass destruction, artificial starvation. In May 21, Lenin wrote in uh, a cable to the leaders of the Bolshevik regime in Ukraine, Frunze Petrovsky and Drakovsky. The harvest in the South is wonderful. Now the main issue of all Soviet power of life and death for us is to collect 230,000 puts from Ukraine. Take everything away, set triple cordons, not to miss any places of production, not to lose a single pound. This must be done in a military-like manner. The consequence of such an aggressive food policy and forcible seizure of grain in the starving regions of Ukraine was the first mass artificial famine of 21-23, which claimed the lives of 3.5 million Ukrainians. The Bolsheviks managed to disguise it but blending it with a natural famine that occurred in the Volga region and some other regions of the former Russian Empire in the early 20s. 
the Bolsheviks used as experience of instrumentalized application of the 1921-1923 famine, as well as the concealment of its true course when preparing their next crime, a much large-scale attack on the foundations of the Ukrainian nation's existence. Having destroyed the social fabric of the Ukrainian society through collectivization and dictulacization, the communists organized the crime of genocide in Ukraine in 1932-1933 in order to destroy the Ukrainian nation as a whole, which in turn should have eliminated the potential for Ukraine to secede from the USSR, creating the preconditions for the genocide of Ukrainians started in the late 1920s. In particular, on the eve of the Holodomor genocide, the Bolsheviks launched a sweeping campaign of repressions against the Ukrainian intelligentsia and the Ukrainian National Church. The goal of the genocidal Holodomor was to eliminate the very foundations of the National Liberation Movement of Ukrainians and prevent the restoration of the Ukrainian state. During the 1932-1933 genocide of Holodomor, the communist regime exterminated 10.5 million Ukrainians in Ukraine and Ukrainian ethnic lands within the former Soviet Union, including over 9 million in Ukraine proper. The Bolsheviks had long denied the very fact of famine, forbidding even the use of the word famine to refer to what they had done in Ukraine. Notably, it is in the same way that the current political regime of Putin's Russia forbids calling its invasion of our state a war. In the 90 years since the first genocide of Ukrainians, the Kremlin has not changed at all. Concealing the crimes of the Soviet leadership, its successor, the Russian Federation, continues to spread the myths across the world about the union-wide famine that allegedly affected the Soviet Union in the early 1930s, regardless of the intentions of the Russian Bolsheviks. The extermination of the Ukrainian intelligentsia continued during the Great Terror and other large-scale repressive campaigns of the 1930s, which killed about 600,000 people. In early autumn of 1939, the communist reprisals were extended to the Western Ukrainian lands that had been occupied by the Red Army in furtherance of the secret agreements of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. During 1939 through 1941, tens of thousands of people living in these areas were deported to the SSR's concentration camps and settlements in remote areas. Thousands were imprisoned and executed. In 1946 through 1947, after the end of World War II, instead of a post-war reconstruction, the communist regime organized a third artificial mass famine that claimed the lives of 1.5 million Ukrainians. With its instrument of mass extermination by starvation alone, the Kremlin's communist regime killed 15.5 million Ukrainians who died as martyrs in 1921-1923, 1932-1933, For comparison's sake, this is about the same number of people that now live in Denmark, Norway, and Finland combined. And 2019 through 2021, a pre-trial investigation into the Holodomor genocide of Ukrainians, which was carried out by the Security Service of Ukraine, helped to make careful estimates of the demographic losses of Ukrainians as a result of actions of the Russian communist regime. It is from these investigation files that the figures I have quoted come from. The Crimean Tatars became another people on Ukrainian soil who were subject to mass extermination by the Kremlin. In May 1944, the communist totalitarian regime deported Crimean Tatars, the Kremlin, 
from the Crimea to Central Asia and Siberia in two weeks. More than 193,000 people were relocated from the Crimean Peninsula and deported for life. Another 13.2 thousand Kirimli were deported in 1945-1946. Following resettlement, the living conditions deteriorated so sharply that it resulted in a significant reduction in the number of Crimean Tatar people. In November 2015, the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine recognized the forced eviction of Crimean Tatars, which put these people into living conditions that led to accelerated depopulation as an act of genocide. Since 2016, the victims of genocide of the Crimean Tatars in Ukraine have been commemorated on May 18. Russia has always viewed Ukraine as the main object of its genocidal policy. This was due to the fact that by denying the Ukrainians their right to existence and by destroying them, the Kremlin also tried to appropriate the culture and history of our people. The existence of the Russian Empire, including its communist version, without Ukraine was impossible. That is why Moscow alternated periods of direct physical extermination of Ukrainians, primarily representatives of national culture, with apparently peaceful periods when Russia committed spiritual and moral genocide. Whenever the Ukrainian resistance to Russification tended to grow, the Kremlin resorted to the physical genocide of Ukrainians yet again. Today's Russian aggression against Ukraine is no exception. Putin's propaganda does not even try to hide that the attack on our state was committed because of the feeling that Ukrainians are living for good. The Russian leader keeps repeating that Ukrainians and Russians are allegedly one people, and therefore, for him personally, there is no separate Ukrainian people. According to Putin's perverted logic, accordingly, the Ukrainian state has no right to exist independently. Timofey Sergeyev's article, What Should Russia Do With Ukraine?, published on April 3, 2022, on the website of the state Russian news agency Novosti, calls explicitly for the liquidation of Ukrainians as a separate nation, explaining that Putin's denazification actually means de ukrainization and genocide. Such rhetoric is no different from that of Hitler's. The Nazi regime of the Third Reich committed the Holocaust, killed millions of people of other nationalities, and caused terrible destruction on entire countries, including Germany, which gave birth to this regime. German Nazism was condemned and Nazi ideology banned. The biggest mistake of the world's democracies in the 20th century was that they did not do the same with the communist regime of the Soviet Union. Satisfied with the defeat of the USSR in the Cold War, the collective West did not demand that the post-communist states of Eastern Europe and, above all, Russia, should carry out real and consistent decommunization and legally condemn the crimes of communism. Thus, the problem spilled over to the 21st century. Only some states that emerged after the collapse of the USSR performed decommunization on their own initiative, and Lithuanians' experience in this regard deserves the highest approval. Meanwhile, diametrically opposite processes were taking place in Russia. Putin, who is de facto successor to the communist regime, has transformed its legacy into a new form of totalitarian rule, sometimes called Putin Putinism and sometimes Russism a symbiosis in fascism and Stalinism, using the misleading talk about the protection of the Russian language and culture as a guise, Moscow imposes its ideology and known rules of the game on the Russian-speaking people around the world. The Kremlin's main goal is to turn Russia into a superpower. Putin is not at all interested in the price he will have to pay for this. Zombifying Russia's citizens Putin's propaganda uses a real Orwellian newspeak in which the killing of Ukrainians is called liberation. Millions of Russians repeat this lie 
without even trying to think about who or what they're going to liberate us from, from our life, obviously. During the two months of the Russian aggression against Ukraine, more than 25,000 civilians in our country were killed, including more than 200 children. The flourishing Ukrainian cities of Mariupol, Irpin, Bucha, Vorzid, Borodyanka, and Kharkiv were turned into rubble. More than 10 million Ukrainians have been forced to leave their places of residence, and more than 5 million of them have gone abroad now. The crime of genocide that Russia is committing in Ukraine today is particularly brutal and cynical. For example, in one of the liberated cities of Ukraine, the Russian occupiers had shot a young mother, tied her living child to the already dead woman, and attached an explosive device between them. When people tried to untie them, it detonated. Such atrocities are supported by a large part of the population of Russia, which was injected with Russia's propaganda on television. According to the polls by active group, most Russians do not mind their troops attacking other countries. 86.6% of Russians support a potential attack on the European Union. 46% of the respondents are absolutely convinced that the Russian government should attack the EU and 406 believe that the expansion of hostilities is quite permissible. According to the poll, the three countries that are going to be the next victims of Russia's attacks are Poland, 75.5% of respondents, the Baltic states, including Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, 41% of the respondents, and also Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary, 39.6%. During the survey, respondents had the opportunity to choose from among several countries. Putin's decree conferring the rank of the guards on the 64th Separate Infantry Brigade is a proof that the genocide of Ukrainians in Ukrainian cities and villages had been approved by the Gremlin leader. It is safe to say that Putin was not going to stop in Ukraine. Ukraine has simply became a stick in his craw. The armed forces of Ukraine and the volunteer formations of the territorial defense are fighting today not only for the existence of Ukraine, but also for the whole democratic world. And in this struggle, Ukrainians are showing extraordinary self-sacrifice. During the battles for Mariupol, Ukrainian border guard Ihor Dashko blew himself up with a hand grenade along with a radio station to prevent the Russian occupiers from seizing that radio station. The last words of the hero of Ukraine were glory to Ukraine. Another example of heroism from among many hundreds is the Marine Vitaly Shakun, a hero of Ukraine. To stop the advance of the enemy tank column, a decision had been made to blow up the Henichesk road bridge. Vitaly himself volunteered to accomplish this mission, and he blew the bridge up, killing himself in the explosion. His heroic deed helped slow down significantly the advance of the enemy, allowing the armed forces of Ukraine to organize defense. We are winning, and the victory will definitely be ours thanks to the support of the whole democratic world today, both material and also moral support of our state is important for us. As early as in April 22, the parliaments of Czechia and Brazil recognized the 1932-1933 Holodomor as genocide, while the parliaments of Estonia, Latvia, Canada, uh, Lithuania and Czechia adopted resolutions recognizing the actions of Russia's political and military leadership during the current Russian-Ukrainian wars, genocide of the Ukrainian nation. Ukraine is very grateful for such moral solidarity. The genocide perpetrated by Russians in Ukraine today has a different face than the Holodomor of 1932-1933. This time, 
It is not starvation, it's murdering women, children, and the elderly. Many victims of the Russian occupiers are found with their hands tied behind their backs with signs of brutal torture and abuse. Genocide today is mass rape. It's total destruction of property and infrastructure in cities and villages, which leads to a situation of humanitarian catastrophe. It is switching forcibly to Russian as the language of instruction in the temporarily occupied territories. It is the destruction of monuments of culture and values, monuments of history and architecture, Ukrainian books. It is the massacre of people without whom a nation cannot exist, who are the custodians of our culture, traditions, and language. These are the murders of educators and teachers. This is the forcible removal of children to the Russian Federation. 180,000 children have now been illegally transported by the occupiers to Russia, including 2,000 orphans and children left without parental care. This is the stealing of medical equipment from hospitals located in the temporarily occupied territories. After all, the genocide today is the destruction of Ukrainian agricultural machinery and grain silos with the aim of disrupting the planting season activities so as to use hunger as a tool of oppression and destruction once again. Instances of brutality and violence in the actions of the Russian occupiers include torture of civilians and Ukrainian servicemen in the occupied territories where Russian knackers cut bones from living people and insert barbed wire in their stead. They retell these and other crimes to their relatives. A phone conversation like that was intercepted by the security service of Ukraine. The most immortal thing here is that their relatives are supportive of them and regret they can't take part in their in their doings. This is all you need to know about the aggressor country and its people. Ukraine has already appealed to the United States and the world asking it to recognize Russia as a sponsor of terrorism. Lithuania, as our staunch friend, has uh, passed such a decision. The hybrid nature of the genocide launched by Russia against Ukrainians at the same time as it began its military invasion of Ukraine on February 24th raises the issue of whether the existing international instruments governing the prevention and punishment of genocide should be amended. The idea that the UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide adopted in December 1948 does not provide adequate protection to large groups of people against the dangers of mass extermination has been discussed for a long time. Ukraine and the democratic world might start working in this direction today. It is Ukraine whose citizens are today the victims of Russia's hybrid genocide that can promote this process of uh, making amendments to international law. No less attention should be focused today on how Russia, under the colors of science and culture, has in recent years tried to impose its worldview on the international community and destroy the democratic world. The Russian world is impossible without wars, without occupations, without repressions and genocide. Violence and war are its ancestral features. After the aggressor who inflicted its insidious blow on Ukraine is defeated, the democratic world must deputinize Russia. The same deputinization of Conscience should perhaps benefit some Western politicians who for many years have tried to understand Russia and justify its aggressive policy. When you are criticized for helping Ukraine, ignore it. It is an echo of Putin's propaganda that has invested a lot of money into blackmailing Europe with a World War III. I would also like to know that the defeat of Putinism will also be the final victory of the democratic world over communism. Only by acting together, we will be able to put the political and military leadership of Russia on trial at The Hague and save the democratic world.
Let me thank the conveners of this event and especially Mr. Robert Van Warren for the invitation to come and the opportunity to speak at this conference. Thank you, world. Thank you, Lithuania. Thank you, all international leaders, for supporting Ukraine, for supporting armed forces. Glory to Ukraine, glory to the democratic world, to victory together. Thank you so much for being with us today, Alicia. I would like to welcome the next speaker, uh, Michal Shishkin, who is one of the most prominent names in contemporary Russian literature. Michal Shishkin was born in Moscow, worked as a school teacher and a journalist, and then emigrated in 1995 to Switzerland. He's the only writer who received all the most important and prestigious Russia's literary awards, the Russian Booker Prize in 2000, the National Bestseller Prize in 2006, and the Big Book Prize in 2006 and 2011. His books have been translated in 35 languages, and he is also now very well known because of his articles in the Western press uh, in relation to the war in Ukraine. Mikhail. The floor is yours. Thank you, Robert, very much for having invited me. I would like to start with two short essays. A letter to Europe on demand. Dear Europe, who are you? What are you? Where are you? I was born in Europe, but you were behind the barbed wire for me. I wanted to read your writers, but many of them were forbidden. I wanted to stroll the streets of your cities, but you were out of reach for me. For generations of Soviet people, you were a fairy tale, a myth. Europe is a Russian myth about human life. For us who were suffocating behind the Iron Curtain, you embodied European values individual rights, respect for human dignity, freedom, all that we were deprived of. It was for this Europe that Ukrainians came to the Maidan in 2014. Men and women from the Heavenly Hundred gave their lives on the barricades for this Europe, not for the European Union represented by officials in Brussels, but for human life at home. They rebelled against the criminal gang that ruled in Ukraine and that still rules in Russia. Their Europe was synonymous with dignity. This is exactly what the dictator in the Kremlin cannot forgive them. He will never forgive. That is why Russian propaganda drives into the heads of Russians that Europe is fascism. Most of the Russian population is zombified by television and believes that America and Europe are waging a war to destroy Russia by the hands of the Ukrainian Nazis. In their image of the world, Russia is an island surrounded by enemies and Europe is the cradle of fascism and we need to defend our homeland from it again as our grandfathers did. Propaganda lies, but lies are a victorious weapon. Europe, you can't even imagine that your main passion is hatred for Russia. Your main goal is to destroy it. Of course, you are not like that. But what are you like? 
Remember the last pre-war years, now we will call the beginning of the 21st century in this way. You felt sick, exhausted by financial problems, contradictions, crises, the dominance of bureaucracy, Europe of officials who tell farmers what and how they should cultivate in their fields, Europe choking in waves of Asian and African refugees, Europe from which countries are fleeing. The feeling of Europe as a common European home, which its builders were so happy about after the Second World War, disappeared over time. Probably this happens with every large new house. After a common housewarming party, residents gradually cease to feel this joy of community. Everyday problems and worries turn neighbors against each other. One litters in the entrance, the other makes noise at night, the third borrows money and doesn't give it back, someone does not pay rent, and someone tries to restore order and gets on everyone's nerves. Why love such neighbors? Why love such a Europe? It is not surprising that centrifugal forces were so intensified. I don't want to belong to Europe, you said, and voted for Brexit. And then COVID came and you got closed borders, draconian measures. You went into self-isolation and waited for it all to end. We pay attention to the air only when we lack it. European values are the air you breathe. If the Europeans really did not notice the real wealth, freedom, constitutional rights, democracy, separation of powers, independent judicial proceedings, free and not falsified elections, then everything was not so bad with you. Because after the COVID, the war came, and you, Europe, suddenly felt like yourself and you. In the face of a common threat, you rallied, again experienced solidarity, felt the need to protect your freedom, your common home, your dignity, all the things you are not ready to give up everything that you live by. In 2014, Ukraine said, Je suis Europe. You were silent. And now when Russian missiles are destroying Ukrainian cities, Russian soldiers are robbing, raping, killing, you finally answered, Je suis Ukraine. It's like you've been awakened. You woke up from the delusion. For so many years, you have been entangling yourself hand and foot with the threads of Putin's gas pip pipelines, putting yourself as if on a drug on Putin's oil need. Dirty money from Russia, stolen from its people by the Putin regime, infected your banks, your economy, your politicians, Corrupt experts explain to you, Putin and his mysterious Russian soul need to be understood. The West must make concessions. Sanctions will primarily hit us, the Europeans, so they are harmful. It's the Americans who want to quarrel us with the Russians. And we need jobs, gas, peace. And in general, maybe Putin is right. And the Nazis are really in power in Ukraine. And we need peace by all means. Your experts, Europe, deceived you. Now we are at war. This war has made you different. The way you really are. United, strong, humane. You host millions of Ukrainian refugees, women and children. You are turning down the dirty money that the Putin regime is using to finance assassinations. You show solidarity with Ukrainians who are fighting for their freedom and yours, for their future and ours, for the human dignity of Europe and all of humanity. Europe, in these 
terrible days and weeks, you have become yourself. I see you on the squares of your cities. The people who come out to defend humanity against war have beautiful, amazingly beautiful faces. It is important for me that even after the war, after our common victory, you remain as united, strong, wise, young and beautiful, recognizing and correcting your mistakes, understanding who you are and what you want. I don't know if you will read this letter. I'm writing to you anyway and sending it on demand. I know that only unwritten letters do not reach. Thank you. Uh, it had been like this for years. When a taxi driver somewhere in the world found out that I was Russian, a joyful smile immediately came. Putin and thumbs up. I could never understand this love of taxi drivers for Putin. It was just clear to me that this was about different Putins. One couldn't love mine. And the taxi driver created Putin in his image and man became a living soul. Why people hate my Putin is obvious. The KGB agent started the presidential career with the bloody sacrifice of his compatriots. As a pretext for the Chechen war, Muscovites were blown up inside their apartment blocks. Then it went only in one direction, till the raid on Ukraine on February 24. But all these years, other Putins have been admired by many people in the world. In the Russian chaos of the 90s, the battered population finally wanted to establish order and see the humiliated fatherland rise from its knees. They hoped for a new ruler with an iron hand. Generations of slaves identified with the size of their empire. Putin promised to heal the national wound. The time of chaos is over. Russia is coming back to the top of the world. The image created by the propaganda of the omnipotent ruler as savior of his people was well received. The evil West wants to destroy us and only good Tsar can save our Ruski Mir, the Russian world. The return of Crimea to Holy Russia did not bring better roads or water pipes or heated toilets in the villages, but it did give the population the opportunity to be proud of their Putin. The key word of Putin's ideology is Ruski Mir. But the word Mir originally meant the Russian village community. The mentality of a medieval village community still shapes the psyche of broad sections of the population in Russia even today. If someone yelled, Nashik Byut, our people are being beaten, they immediately ran off with sticks and pitchforks without considering whether our own were right or not. This is how Putin's propaganda has been screaming for years now. Our people are being beaten in Ukraine. This peculiarity of the village way of thinking also explains why so many Russians living in the West support Putin and his war. Physically, they live in Berlin, Zurich or Larnaca, but mentally they live in their Ruski Mir. The famous actor Sergei Badrov, a cult figure in Russia. In the box office hit Brother 2, he played a good Russian bandit who comes to America and kills Americans by the dozens. Sergei Badrov put it clearly in an interview. During the war, you can't talk badly about your own, even if they are wrong. On the planet Ruskimir, 
Putin occupied the niche of a good victorious Tsar in the war of the evil West against ours. Now to Putin's niche on planet Earth. I'm not interested in the numerous professional Putin Versteher in the West who earned their bread as Russia experts, as well as the corrupt politicians. Today you are Chancellor of Germany, tomorrow Putin's lucky. But the gratuitous admiration of Putin needs explanation. It's not only on Indian or Latin American online platforms that Putin has been portrayed as a hero who is finally showing the limits of the imperialist United States. Putin spoke from the heart not only of Iranian and North Korean leaders with his famous declaration of war on the USA in Munich in 2007. I quote, a monopolar world that means one power center one decision-making center. This model is unacceptable to the world. It's devastating ultimately for the hegemon itself. The principle, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, united left and right around the world. There were plenty of reasons to love Putin even in Western democracies. The man stands for moral values such as Christianity, protection of the family, the fight against gay marriage and gay parades. He was admired for his demonstrative freedom from any political correctness, for his open anti-wokeness. As the representative of true masculinity, Putin defends the world against the gender madness. The tough guy from the East silently questioned Western society in the cancel culture era. Why should men be ashamed of being men? Why should whites feel burdened with the racist original sin because they are white? For many people, even in democratic countries, his macho behavior seemed impressive. For Brigitte Bardot, Putin was the one who did more for nature and wildlife conservation than all the presidents of France put together. Some were impressed by his muscular, bare-chested pose. And the Swiss journalist and politician Roger Köppel, one of the army of Putin Versteher, summed up the Putin admiration of the world's taxi drivers. Quotation, Putin exposes the hollow moralism of his opponents and the decadence of the West. The Soviet Secret Service agent with the mysterious Russian soul seems to have been only a reflection of Western longings. Now Putin has disappointed his admirers all over the world. Not a brutal macho in the saddle, but a bloated dwarf hiding behind an infinitely long table. No Western politician has done more for NATO's eastward expansion than Putin. More countries will now push their way into the defense alliance. Instead of saving wild enemies and the climate, he led cities being bombed, women raped, children killed. Moral Christian family values look different. The Ruski Mir is also deeply disappointed. The damn Russian questions. Kto vinovat? Who is to blame? Što delat? What to do? Tormented only the intellectuals. For the common people, the most important Russian question was posed differently. Is the Tsar real or fake? Only victories could decide this question. Stalin was real. He is revered to this day. Gorbachev lost both the war in Afghanistan and the Cold War against the West. Gorby was clearly a false star and is frowned upon and hated in Russia to this day. With the annexion of Crimea, Putin has legitimized himself as a real Tsar in the eyes of the population. But the lack of victory in the Ukrainian campaign 
drastically undermines its legitimacy. The oppositional patriotic telegram channels with hundreds of thousands of subscribers are already shouting about high treason and demanding victory to the bitter end. The more coffins return to Russia from Ukraine, the louder the outcry, ours are being beaten. The search for the real Tsar has already begun. They all were disappointed by a specific man because he could not live up to the expectations of his admirers. The man disappears, but his admirers remain with their ideas and expectations. In Russia, deputinization will be carried out by a new Putin with a different name. In the West, even after Putin's disappearance, someone will have to inspire with his macho image and defy US imperialism. Somebody has to stand up against gay marriage, against NATO, against US hegemony. Is people's need for political masculinity curable at all? Putin will disappear. But the longings he projected will not vanish because of this. The actor who played all these Putins on the historical stage failed in every way. The role is now awaiting a new cast. Thank you. It's not easy to speak as a Russian and as a Russian writer, because we are in the third month of the war and it hurts, it hurts to be Russian. This, the aim, the declared aim of this special operation was to save Russians, to save Russian culture, to save Russian language. In the name of the whole country, in the name of my people, in my name, horrible crimes, horrible crimes are committed in Ukraine. My father was Russian, my mom was Ukrainian. And they died many years ago, and I'm happy that they died because it would be as impossible for them to, to see the, this tragedy, to see this catastrophe. And Putin committed horrible crime against my language. Now Russian is associated not, not with uh, Russian literature, not with Putin, not not with Pushkin, yeah, not with Tolstoy, but with the pictures in Bucha. What, what to do with this hate? My father, he, he was 18 when he went to uh, the front to take revenge for his elder brother who was killed by Germans. All his life he hated Germany. He hated everything what was from Germany. And I tried to explain to him, Papa, but, but look, look, wonderful German writers, the language is beautiful. It didn't work for him. Now, what will we say Ukrainians? What would I tell Ukrainians who lost their families, killed by Russian soldiers? Their homes were destroyed by Russian missiles. That the Russian literature is great. That Russian language is beautiful. Would it work? When a war starts, culture is always loser. Yeah. Uh, great German literature couldn't save Germany from Auschwitz, great Russian literature, couldn't save Russia from Gulag. My books, books of my 
colleagues which were published in the last 20, 30 years, could they stop this war? Literature is loser. Culture is loser. Maybe after the war, after the war, there, there will be so much hate and pain. There will be just abyss between Russians and Ukrainians. Maybe after the war, literature could help because the hate is the disease when the only medicine is culture. I'm sure there will be, after every war, people write books. It was with Remark, it was with Hemingway. I'm sure now in Ukraine, young Ukrainian soldiers who are fighting there and also young Russian soldiers, maybe they don't know that they are future writers. But I'm sure after the war, some of them will start to write because they will have to do something with their experience, with this horrible experience. And there will be great, I'm sure there will be great books about death, about pain, about hatred. And they will, will have two different ways of new literature. Ukrainian writers will write about the establishing of a new free democratic state and fighting for it, fighting for dignity. And Russians will try to ask the question, how was it possible that we are fascists? Why we are fascists? I'm, sh I'm very optimistic for Ukraine. After the war, the whole world would help Ukraine to, to rebuild Ukrainian cities. And I'm very pessimistic for Russia. It will be ru in ruin economically. It will be, first of all, in ruin psychologically, mental. How would they understand that they have to take this national guilt. We, we remember this falling on the knees by German Chancellor Willy Brandt in Warsaw. Without this na <coughs> acknowledgement of national guilt, without this Russian falling on knees, in Kharkov, in Mariupol, in, in Kyiv, in all countries where Russian tanks were, in Prague, in Budapest, in Belize, in Vilnius, there would be no future for Russia, no future. I remember a horrible conversation on a telegram channel between a Russian young, uh, he's almost a child, 18 years old, a Russian soldier captured by Ukrainian army, and he was talking per telephone with his mom somewhere in this province city in Russia. And he says, Mom, there are no fascists here. We are killing civilians. We, we, we are fascists here. And her reaction, it's impossible. They, they have beaten you that you say such things. You are a hero. It's her world collapsing. It's impossible for her to accept that her son is a fascist, that, that she's the mother of a fascist. No, 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 it's impossible. We are good. We are always good. They are fascists. What to do with this mother? What, what to do with, with all these millions and millions of people who are believing they are good? They are liberating Ukrainians from the fascists. And after the Second World War, the Germans said, yeah, it turned out that Hitler was a war criminal, a crazy guy, but we didn't know anything. We didn't know anything about the war crimes, about Auschwitz. We, the German people, das Deutsche Volk, we are also just victims of the Nazi regime. I'm sure we will hear the same thing in Russia. We Russians, it turned out that Putin was a war criminal. 
yeah, but we didn't know anything. We thought it is just liberation. We wanted just to help Ukrainian people to liberate them from Nazi junta. We Russian people are just also victims of Putin's regime. And this will be the beginning of new Putin. I don't know how to end my speech in more optimistic way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Misha. So, we now go for lunch. So, we will be back here at uh, 1.30. Thank you very much. <laughs>